Hello and welcome. My name is Raj Basord. I'm a consultant psychiatrist based in practice, in private practice in Harley Street, uh, London. And I'm here at the Royal College of Psychiatrists Annual Congress 2016 in Excel, London. I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Michael Kralak, who is a professor of psychiatry with an interest in the history of psychiatry. And he's traveled all the way from Germany to give a presentation uh, today at the Annual Congress. And the title of his paper is The Euthanasia Program in Nazi Nazi psychiatry. Uh, Michael, so tell us, what was the euthanasia program in Nazi psychiatry? Well, between 1939 and 1945, uh, some 200,000 patients, adults and children, old and young, were killed by German psychiatrists and nurses. This was a pro program which was initiated by, by Hitler. Uh, the same day when the first world, the Second World War started, the first of uh, September 1939, he wrote a decree in which he allowed doctors to, as he called it, to give a merciful death to to severely ill patients. And uh, immediately after that, they founded an administration in Berlin. Uh, to to, uh, to start with the program, uh, all organized by psychiatrists, and uh, this uh, this administration was in the Tiergartenstrasse four. Therefore, historians speak of the Action T four. That's uh, the, the name under which is you find it in the, the in the books. And uh, the first thing that these people did is to. Uh, to make a questionnaire which was sent to all mental hospitals and they had to fill in for every patient this questionnaire and they wanted to know only three things they wanted to know if the patient did some sort of valuable work at the institution in which he which was second is was he a Jewish patient or not a Jewish patient and the third question they wanted to know if he was a forensic patient or not, if he had committed some severe uh, crime. So these uh, questionnaires were returned to Berlin and then the, uh, this administration uh, called up 50 psychiatrists, the, 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 the elite of German psychiatry, professors and directors of the hospitals, and uh, they were informed about this program and they were asked to go through this uh, hundreds, thousands of uh, of uh, questionnaires, and just to, to make a, a plus or a minus if they thought the patient should fall into this action. Then, uh, in six hospitals, they built up gas chambers. These were rooms of about uh, 60 to 80 square meters, uh, in which you, in which they could. Uh, introduce uh, carbon monoxide produced by the big diesel engines and then they organized a transport company and then in, in the which they were called the gray buses and they came to the different hospitals collected the patients brought them to these gas chambers where and immediately after after coming they were uh, they were killed Though they, or no, or, on all these six uh, gas chamber institutions, there was a team with doctors and nurses who um, who observed the dying of the patient, and then the the relatives were informed with a faked uh, death diagnosis uh, about the death of the patient. This uh, was the first program. It was ended uh, in August 90, uh, 1941. Uh, why was it ended after they had killed 70,000 patients? Why was it killed? There are two reasons for that. One is that uh, the population didn't really accept that. All the relatives, but even the, the bigger population knew what was happening and, and uh, they really uh, uh, criticized the system. But the second thing is that within the Catholic Church was uh, a minority uh, who uh, who was very active in, in condemning these things. And there was a very uh, brave uh, uh, Catholic priest who, in August '41, uh, he was a bishop and he spoke for, in the church about patients being murdered, and. Uh, 
So the Nazis uh, stopped this program. Today historians say there was another reason, because you can see that all these this, uh, teams who were in the six gas chambers, now you can find them in the Polish concentration camps. So that uh, in, in 40, at the end of 41, 42, and now historians say that this first killing of 70,000 patients was the rehearsal for the Holocaust. But then the, the killing continued in the hospitals themselves. We call this the decentralized euthanasia program. How did they kill the patients? There were several different uh, programs. One was for was from for children. Uh, they uh, organized in 20 mental hospitals, special units for children, and, and young children who were born with some sort of uh, uh, handicap or, well, uh, and children even until, until the age of, uh, of 16 were admitted to this unit, were thoroughly uh, uh, examined, and uh, about one half were killed immediately, directly by giving them luminal injections. The barbiturate injections. And this was one of the programs. We know that some 8,000 children were killed by, by this way. Then the others, there were two programs. One was that in many hospitals they introduced what they called a starvation diet. Uh, this for all the, the patients who did not work uh, at the institution in some way. Uh, they were put on a starvation diet, uh, and uh, s some, some 80, 90,000 died of starvation. And then, and then in the last years, between the end of 43 to 45, uh, they killed even adults with, uh, with luminal barbiturate injections. There was a special program for Jewish patients. There was a special program for forced laborers who fall ill, who developed a, a mental uh, problem. You know that I, I think in the German Reich, uh, in order to keep the industry running, the war industry and uh, the agriculture, everything, they had something like six million of forced laborers, who mainly from, the, from Eastern European countries. And if they uh, developed a psychiatric uh, problem, they were admitted to certain units, and uh, the advice was to, to to administer a very intensive treatment in the hope that they will come go to work very s quickly. But then there was the, this letter from the ministry in Berlin ended with a sentence: "If after four weeks there is no uh, treatment success, stop any sort of of treatment." And, they too killed these patients. So in the whole, we know now that more than 200,000 patients died in this horrible way. I was talking to um, Frank Schneider about this, and, and there's a separate podcast interview that people can listen to, and he was emphasizing the idea was, were these people useful? If they were not useful, if they could not work, then they were going to get eliminated, if I can put it that way. Was this criterion of usefulness at work also applied to patients with physical disorders? Because you could have a physical illness, and that could mean that you were not useful in terms of working. But would those patients also be killed, no. or was particularly psychiatric patients? It was particularly psychiatric patients. And you know that this idea of, of being useful or, or useless, that wasn't a Nazi uh, ideology. Just many years before, Within psychiatry, this concept were introduced. In 1920, uh, a psychiatrist and a lawyer they wrote a book uh, in which they, for, for, for in, in many pages, they, they discussed this problem of uselessness. You know that they started, you, you can see it in the literature from 19 on, there was a discussion that, that, that patients within psychiatry have a different value, you know, uh, that they're not equal, that there are persons, and even outside psychiatry, who are less valuable than others. Uh, that was the horrible uh, thing. So that this wasn't a, a, a Nazi uh, terminology. The Nazis used it uh, 
in order to, to, to get rid of the problem. But it is an old, this is a very, uh, for us psychiatrists, very sad and, and, and painful thinking that it wasn't, uh, we were not, the, the psychiatrists were not the victims of Hitler. You see. We had thought these things many years before. But was that a particularly German psychiatric view mm. about usefulness and work linked to psychiatric problems? I mean, was the same thing happening in Britain in, in the same era, or was it a particularly German psychiatric approach? Well, you know that there was a, a huge and important movement of eugenics, uh, which reduced man to his genetic uh, qualities and uh, properties. And in, in this discussion, which was a worldwide discussion, in which British and American and, and Scandinavian uh, doctors participated, uh, uh, you, you can find that the saying that patients have a, a, a diverse genetic uh, basis, yeah, they introduce the concepts that, patient, that persons are different. Uh, the persons, uh, and you can feel in the discussions, they, they don't say it openly that uh, one race is more valuable than the other, but I, I, they had this in, in mind. In your researching into this very dark period in the history of German psychiatry and mm -hmm. the history of Germany generally, what was the most shocking thing that you found, or the most disturbing thing in, in terms of relationship of the, the, what psychiatrists well, were doing? Well, oh. the most disturbing thing is that when I started, uh, uh, in 1980, I started researching these issues. I thought th this was a, a group of criminal psychiatrists uh, who the Nazi used uh, to, to, to make this program. But then, quickly, I, I, I recognized that this was the el elite of German psychiatrists. They were humanistically educated. They were Christians, most of them. Uh, and uh, I, I would say psychiatrists as I am a psychiatrist. And I started thinking, what would I, I have done if I would have lived at that time? Uh, and uh, so, therefore, I got involved in, 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 in write about the, the, the ideas. Uh, what are the conditions under which good Psychiatrists uh, murder their patients. Uh, what and, and and so on today. Uh, later, I'm speaking a little bit about that. And there's no time to develop these ideas, but uh, you, you, if you get involved in this, you start understanding why they became criminals. Well, one one possibility is a hint in the way you started talking about this that the Nazi idea was a merciful death. I mean, these people, I imagine the theory was we're never going to recover, mm -hmm. so you were doing them a, a favor by, by killing them. Is that one well, of the things that happened? Well, no, because th this merciful death is written in, the, in Hitler's letter, but that's the only moment where, where these words appear, you see. Okay. They killed them in the most brutal way, you see. The patients, I spoke to the to the priest, uh, who was the Catholic priest of the institution where I started to work in the 80s. Uh, and uh, he told me that after, uh, he was the priest at that time. Uh, and he said that when the first bus came to collect the first group of patients, you see, the patients felt that something is unusual, but they went into the bus and, and so on. But a few days later, uh, a bus brought the, the, the cloths of the patients uh, back and the, and the cloths, apparently they were torn out with, by force from the patients. And then a few days later, the relatives started to ringing in, 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 and asking, my mother, my father, my child has died. Uh, and, he, and this priest says that uh, when the next bus came, uh, a few weeks later, to collect the next group of patients. The patients all knew what were going. They were crying, shouting, trying to flee. They came out knocking at this door. And they wanted to confess, as, because that's a Catholic region. Uh, uh, and the children have been killed with, a, with an enormous, brutal way. You know, I, shall I give you some? Because, you know, they, they murdered the children with... Uh, with luminal, with a barbiturate. If you take a lethal doses of barbiturate, you die after three or four hours. Your your um, your respiratory muscles uh, um, don't work anymore, and and you die. And when and you, but 
making the autopsy, you don't see anything. Yeah. And then they thought, ah, that's bad because we want to make an autopsy and we want to, uh, to not to lie too much to the relatives. So let us give the children a sublethal doses so that it takes two to three years, uh, two to three days until they die. And then in the meanwhile, they develop a pneumonia. And so in the autopsy, we can tell the relatives, oh, he died of pneumonia. So a terrible, uh, the brutality was, uh, the, the bloodthirstiness and uh, and yet, and how could these doctors do that? Uh, and what is your answer to that question? Well, w there are several answers. One answer is that uh, if you read the notes, you, know, you can uh, identify the moment when the doctor has decided I will kill this patient. You identify it because before this moment. He describes the patient as you see in any notes of the world, citing psychopathological symptoms and things like that. And suddenly, uh, he just uh, writes denigrating, negative uh, value judgments, useless, a nuisance. Uh, and I think that uh, by uh, by by. Uh, Using these pejorative words, it was easier to kill them. You know? And some patients, some doctors, really said, w "We are not killing patients; we annihilated them because they are not persons; they are objects." You know? So, uh, it's a terrible story. You know? But the other thing that's very puzzling is the diversion of just sheer the amount of medical time that gets diverted away from helping people mm -hmm. and getting them well to killing them. I find that very peculiar because most doctors go into medicine because they want to help people and they want to get people better and they want to ameliorate suffering. Mm -hmm. There was a massive shift. No, no. If you speak to them, if you, they would say, no, there was a shift. We were completely uh, uh, enthusiastic with the new therapeutic methods. We were the avant-garde of therapy, uh, using insulin coma treatment, uh, electroshock treatment, uh, and so we cared more than any in other countries about for our patients, but just for those who were treatable. Uh, and those who are not treatable, we don't uh, lose time. Uh, uh, Was part of the attraction of the Nazi ideology the notion of elites, the notion that elites are different? from the patients or the lower orders. Mm -hmm. um, is that one of the reasons why doctors as a profession maybe were attracted to the ideology, but it also drove a wedge between them and, and patients? Patients were lesser people. Um, do you think there was there's something of that going on? Well, look, uh, this uh, program opened a l po enormous possibilities to doctors. The, the researchers, the brain researchers, uh, as I will tell later, were enthusiastic by this getting so much brains and things like that. The doctors uh, uh, got enthusiastic because the, the, the conditions in the hospitals became better, uh, because what they killed the, the, the chronic patients, you see. Uh, the, uh, and the doctors, Many said that they were so proud that they were participating in a unique experiment which mankind had never, ever before uh, allowed. Uh, uh, and then, for many of the doctors, it was career, purely career, because the more they engaged, the more attention they got in, in the system. Did they publish this research? No, they, no, no. But what happened there then? Why didn't they publish it if they were so keen on all these brains they were getting from killing so many patients? You, you know, there has, there, has, there has been a lot of research about uh, have we gained insights, scientific insights, using these brains? And it's, no, they did publish it. It was just... Uh, the results were completely... Because... Uh, because neuropathology at that time was a very uh, just describing changes and so, and uh, they didn't. That is the uh, the, the contradiction you know, that they published very little. And after the world, after the, the World War Two in the in the seventies and the eighties, there were some German psychiatrists who 
who got back to this uh, histopathological findings and uh, because they, they were kept in the archives of the institutes and uh, this was a scandal because they published in American and British journals uh, papers on, on, on the brains of the, of, of the victims and uh, without saying that they were the victims that came out was a big discussion in the 80s. Did, did, did those papers get uncovered for what they were, and has there been some kind of redress? Yeah, there is. Uh, um, the, not so much, but some of... Because I, I tell you, they didn't publish much. Because after 45, uh, 1945, uh, German psychiatrists had little access or no access to, to international papers, and uh, it was a time when much was published. Uh, you mentioned the brutality of the killing, but as I understand what you're telling us is the killing was always done through injections. It began with a, with a kind of chamber, a kind of gas chamber, gas chamber, but then it shifted to injections. Yes, to injections and the starvation diet. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me a bit more about the starvation diet. The starvation, the starvation diet was um, uh, introduced in uh, autumn 1941. The director of the mental hospital in Kaufbeuren, where I went in 1980, uh, he had made, had made experiments. Uh, uh, what is it to do, develop a diet so, so organized that the patient die after three to four months? Uh, and uh, he made a, an experiment and if find out that just cooking in water without any sort of additions, uh, cabbage and uh, very few cabbage and potato, peels of potatoes and things like this, that the patients, no, they don't die of, they don't get to a final starvation death, but after two, three, four months, they die of pneumonia, they, they, they are so, Weak that they get an other diseases or tuberculosis and so and so he presented these results in Munich. This was in Munich uh, um, to the ministry and to his colleagues, and then the ministry decided that this diet should be administered in all mental hospitals to uh, to those patients who the year before were sent to the gas chambers. But the thing is that not all doctors introduced, not all directors introduced the diet in their institutions. So, and uh, this is important to know. There are very few who, who, who openly said, I'm not going to participate. And nothing happened to them. So they didn't, they didn't do it because they were forced. You see, they, There was ample room for maneuver, for, for avoiding to participate. But very, very few refuse to participate. Are you absolutely sure about that? I find that incredible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's absolutely sure. We have, because we have looked. Is there in the whole uh, country, is there, can we find one person who had a real trauma or a real uh, problem? Yeah? Uh, no one. Yeah? No one. There is a good example of Professor Ewald, he was the, uh, the hair of the, the, the chief psychiatrist at the University of Göttingen. And when he was summoned to be informed, to be an expert, to, to think, to, to feel, to, to uh, select with his uh, questioners, he stood up and said, what you are planning is murder. He openly said, I am not participating. And he left the session. He went and he, he continued to be professor until the end of the world. Nothing happened to him. The Nazis, they were not, they were, first, they were not quite sure if, uh, if the population stands behind this thing. And secondly, they, they knew the psychiatrists, they are completely involved and they... What proportion of psychiatrists refused to take part? Oh, very few. You can, a handful. Uh -huh. of, of thousands? In the profession. Oh, I suppose. Uh, okay. Well, not of thousands. You, you know, uh, German medicine is extremely hierarchical uh, and um, much more than, in, than it was maybe in England with such an old uh, democratic tradition. And uh, junior doctors, I, as I know from my research, they all participated because it's not my, uh, it's not my responsibility. If my boss 
does this. I don't. Uh, they just uh, got rid of their conscience, conscience by saying it's their responsibility. This whole era, era of history in terms of German medicine and German psychiatry had kind of lied a bit dormant and people had been reluctant maybe oh, yes, to look into it. And you, you've been part of a group of people who've tried to um, lift the lid on it. Um, why is it important? I mean, a lot of people might say this is ancient history. It happened a long, long time ago. Um, why, why rekindle an interest? And, and this interest in it has been relatively recent, only the last two decades or three decades. Mm -hmm. So wh why is it important and why has there been a rekindling of interest in this era? Well, I tell you, we had uh, a psychiatric reform uh, much later than you had in England, uh, which started in the late uh, 70s and started officially in the 80s. And several of us young psychiatrists went to the big mental hospitals to change. And when I went to, uh, to Kaufbeuren, I, I found the most terrible conditions uh, you can imagine. I had I've done part of my training here in England, so I, I knew how it could be. And therefore, and to others had the same uh, experience. And so some of us thought this has something to do with, uh, with the past. We cannot reform psychiatry without going looking what happened in the past. Uh, and, uh, and so we started, and, uh, because nobody knew about this thing. They had been forgotten completely or, re or repressed, regret, repressed. Nobody wanted to know about that. And so, in the 80s, there were several psychiatrists who started to write about this and uh, to write in the newspapers, because we have two things in mind. One thing is that we want to return the dignity, you see, to the victims, you see, because they are forgotten victims, you know, and even to bring them back into their families, because the, the families were completely unsure. They didn't speak about this within the family. Yeah. So one thing was the dignity of the victims, and recognizing them as victims. The second thing was that to learn from history, because we, we knew that many of the problems we, are, we had in Germany, and we still are having, yeah, are related to this past. What, what problems? Well, you, you, we have a very different uh, psychiatric development as you have. For instance, all this terrible, huge mental hospitals still exist in Germany. They are now better, the, the buildings are better, the, the conditions are naturally better, but we didn't close, we didn't integrate psychiatry, general medicine. So we still have, and this is, all has something to do with this, uh, with this past. We are talking at a particularly interesting moment in the history of politics of Europe. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of political turmoil, mm -hmm. and um, some people are seeing the rise of the right, or mm -hmm. at least the rise of extremism in certain European countries. Mm -hmm. Do you think this could happen again? Do you think that if there was the rise of totalitarianism or authoritarian regimes, that psychiatrists at a major Western country like Germany or France or Italy, Spain mm -hmm. or the UK uh, might collaborate? Mm -hmm over the, um, the decimation of their patients? Well, I think that, uh, uh, at least in, in German and Austrian society where I'm, uh, I'm acquainted with, there always has been, I would say, 20% uh, of, uh, of people who, who, who are, I wouldn't say fascist, but who are right wing or extremely right wing who re remain from that time uh, and uh, we were lucky in Germany that the official parties the, 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 the more conservative parties uh, uh, took care of this of, of this but now since uh, it's with the immigration issue we had uh, now a new party has been formed. Uh, they say that they're, they're gaining 20, 25 percent. I, I, I don't think so. I think there is this group of, of, of extreme right-wing people, and, uh, but I don't think they would change. In Germany, it would, won't change much. So it, it can't happen again? Not in Germany, at the Oh, oh, oh I, I wouldn't say that it can't happen again. You see, because uh, if you look at the conditions, it's naturally can happen again. In Germany, I, I, 
I'm quite critical about uh, the German way of doing things, but in this uh, aspect, uh, I think Germany is uh, there is really a conscious that 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 brutal and terrible things have have occurred in the past. So there is an open discussion about that. Uh, uh, therefore, I'm in this sense, I'm optimistic. Children really in school learn from the first years what happened, are confronted with that. And so I think that the majority, uh, it's a good way of dealing with this uh, terrible past. Uh, Professor Dr. Michael von Krach, thank you very much indeed. Okay.